Lord's Day evening worship. It is that we extend that welcome to those who gather with us here in Toronto and also to those of you who meet with us online. And it is again that we're thankful that this is the day that the Lord has made. We are commanded to rejoice and to be glad in it. And we have ample reason to be glad in it because the God and Savior whom we rejoice in is the one who is alive and alive forevermore. And it is we rejoice to say that He has risen. So let's then sing to God's praise in Psalm 91. We're going to sing the B selection, Psalm 91. 
the one who is a refuge safe, the Most High, as his dwelling place, will with Almighty God abide and in his shadow safely hide. And there's the comfort, but I think also the challenge to us as well, to ask ourselves if it is that we have a safe refuge, and if it is that we know of this Lord, eh, the one who is most high as our dwelling place. Let's then stand to sing 91, the B selection to God's praise. Our God and our Father, as we stand before you this Lord's Day evening, we thank you for this further opportunity that you give to us in terms of this means of grace, that we can gather in Christ's name and we can seek the face and the favor of our Creator and our God. And we thank you that even as we have sung that many, if not all of us here and online, that it is that we are able to say that you are our refuge and our strength, that you are a very present help in time of trouble. And so it is that we pray, even as we confess our sins, that we might be enabled to rejoice again in a, a crucified and risen Savior, who is Jesus Christ, the Lord. Lord, what we pray for ourselves, we pray also for a, our brothers and sisters throughout the length and breadth of our land this night. And we do pray, our God, uh, that uh, you by your Spirit might so move that many in Canada tonight and through this your day come to a saving knowledge of Christ, and that your people would be upbuilt in their most holy faith. So, Father, we draw near you. Again, we ask graciously that you would draw near unto us, and accept us in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Now, scripture reading this evening is taken from the Old Testament scriptures and from the first book of Samuel, and chapter 30, 1 Samuel, and chapter 30. It's a chapter that we've considered a number of years ago. In fact, if you go on our website, you'll find a sermon from a number of years ago on the words that we're going to consider tonight. But it's, tonight's sermon is a different sermon uh, on these words. But we're going to uh, read 1 Samuel chapter 30, and we'll read the whole of this chapter. Now, when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev, and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. 
and taken captive the woman and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So David set out and the 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men. 200 stayed behind who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate. They gave him water to drink and they gave him a piece of a, of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived. For he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, to whom do you belong? And where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negev of the Kerithites and against that which belongs to Judah and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Will you take me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. And when he had taken him down, behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped, except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken, David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David, and who had been left at the brook Besor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. But David said, you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? But as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall the share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel and Ramoth, of the Negev, and Jatir and Aroer and Sifmoth, and in Eshtemoa and Rechal, in the cities of the Jeramelites, Jer in the cities of the Kenites, in Hormah and Borashan, in Athach and Hebron, for all the places where David and his men had roamed. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his own holy word. Let's respond now to that reading with the words of Psalm 42 and Selection D. Psalm 42 and Selection D. 
We just read about David and, and his men, and his men were in such despair at what had happened that they were wanting to stone David. And it's almost unbelievable when you read that. And it is that at times we find ourselves in situations of, of despair. And here the psalmist says to us, Oh God, my soul is in despair. So what does he do? He says, I remember you from Jordan's land, from Mizer's Hill, and from Mount Hermon too. Your water falls like thunder roar, and deep to deep will call. So let's stand to sing Psalm 42, the deselection to God's praise. as we continue in terms of our worship, it is that we can receive the weekly tithes and offerings. If you wish to uh, place your offering in the plate, then please do so at the end of the service. And if you prefer to use online banking, then the necessary details you'll find available uh, in the, on the notes. Now, uh, again, all the notes, uh, congregational notes, God willing, uh, this coming Wednesday evening at 7.30 via Skype, prayer and scripture reading, and then the Sunday school classes, next Lord's Day at 10 a.m., and followed thereafter by the services at the usual times of 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. There are notices there concerning the Young Street Mission, the Pregnancy Care Center, fundraising breakfast, and then uh, the dates uh, and the times for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Uh, and it is that, as I said this morning, today we're praying for the West Vancouver RPCC. Now, our prayer items, there's, there's one a addition to what I brought before you this morning, and that's concerning Katrina Morton. Katrina is known to, I think, probably most of us here uh, this evening. It seems that she hasn't been doing too well recently. There was thought that maybe she had got COVID again, but thankfully she hasn't tested positive for COVID, as I understand it. And they're thinking that perhaps it's a bad flu virus uh, that, that she's got at the moment. Seems that she's a little bit better today, so we're thankful to the Lord for that. But uh, let's remember Katrina and her mum and dad and the family. Uh, she's really been having a rough time of it now for a good number of years since she first contracted COVID. So it would be good to remember her at this time. It is that Rod and Helen, as I say, they return God willing on Thursday from North Dakota. And then Jim travels to Sudbury and other locations uh, this coming Thursday till next Monday, a week tomorrow, God willing. So again, it would be good to remember Jim. Uh, also, let's continue to pray 
uh, for peace in the ongoing situation between Israel and Hamas. If you've been keeping up even today, there's talk uh, about Hezbollah perhaps getting involved and even Iran. Uh, and if it is that that happens from a human perspective, uh, dear knows what will happen. Uh, so we need to pray uh, that God by his spirit might move uh, in that powder keg of a situation uh, that would have vast ramifications for the whole world if it is that war erupts in that part of the world. So let's remain seated and seek God's face as we bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, it is that we have been reminded in the words that we have sung and even in the passage that we read uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, that it is that your people, even though they are a people who are richly blessed in all their speaking and in all their thinking, yet it is in terms of your providence and in terms of our own stupidity that at times we can find ourselves in the place of discouragement. But we thank you, O oh God, that your word gives us ample reason uh, not to be discouraged and indeed to encourage ourselves in the things that pertain to our God and our salvation. And so we thank you tonight that yet again we are able to gather in Christ's name, that we are able to come under the sound and the authority of your word, and that we are able in Christ and on the, the basis of what Christ encourages us to do. It is that we ask for the Holy Spirit. And we ask that the Spirit himself, that he might anoint each one of us tonight, that he might open a, the ears of our understanding, and that he might enable us, even though we see through a glass darkly, to behold something of the beauty and the glory of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, Father, that we thank you that uh, we live and move and have our being in him. And we thank you that your word tells us that all things were created by him and through him and for him, and that he is the one who sustains all things. And we pray that this vision of the cosmic and indeed the sovereign Christ might be one that would encourage us, particularly in days of discouragement and days of distress and anxiety. It is, O oh Lord, that we pray for our world tonight, and we know not what it is that the days ahead may hold concerning uh, the ongoing situation uh, in Israel and, and uh, in Gaza, and it is, O oh Lord, that there are many permutations of what could transpire, but we thank you that all is known to you, and we thank you that all that will transpire in the coming days happens in accordance with your will and for your glory. It is, Lord, that we are finite and we cannot understand how it is that you work all things together for the good of your people and for your glory. But it is that we believe. It is that we exercise faith in what you have taught us. And it is, O oh Lord, that we rejoice this night that Jesus Christ, even as we considered this morning, that he alone is King of kings and Lord of lords. Again, we would pray for those who eh, are experiencing heartache and sorrow in Israel and Gaza at the moment. And it is, again, that we pray that for those who are your own, that even in the midst of such a dark and desperate situation, that they might shine as lights in terms of what they say and how they are, and that they might commend the Savior to lost men and women and boys and girls. It is, O Lord, that we ask that you would give wisdom to the world leaders, to those who would make decisions of one sort or another, it would eventually impinge even upon us here in Toronto and elsewhere. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we might, even through the leaders of the world, see you moving in a mighty and a powerful way. It is that we thank you that they, along with ourselves, that they can make you their refuge and their strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And we pray, Lord, that even one little bit of scripture that maybe they heard when they were younger, Oh, we pray, Father, that you might bring that to their heart and mind even now, and that they might face the days to come, difficult and dark days, in the strength and power of Almighty God. We thank you, Father, that we can pray one for another. We thank you for those who visit with us tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you might bless and encourage them. There are those who visit with us here, and perhaps some who visit with us online. And we pray, Lord, that who we are and how we are, it is all known to you, and we pray that you might have a word eh, for our friends tonight and bless them and encourage them eh, in their eh, pilgrimage through this scene of eh, time. It is, O oh Lord, that again we remember the good work that is going on eh, in BC. And in particular, we remember 
the work con concerning, O oh Lord, eh, the Reverend James Zoo in the West Vancouver congregation. We ask for James and for the members of his congregation, uh, particularly as they would eh, present the gospel eh, to eh, their own people group. We ask, Father, that you might bless and encourage them, and that indeed that we would hear of great things being done in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, it is that we are saddened again this evening to hear just of the difficulties that Katrina Morton is facing. Lord, she is a young woman, and it is that for the past number of years that she has just had one trial after another from her initial a, a time with COVID. And we pray, Lord, that we thank you that it's not COVID that she's taken again. And we pray that this flu that, that, that a, she has at the moment, oh, we pray that very soon that she might know of a return of health and strength. We remember, O oh Lord, a, her anxious parents, David and Kathy, as they look on. And we pray, Lord, that in the midst of their sadness and concern, that they also might make you the refuge and their strength. We pray for, for John and we pray for Christina. And we ask, O oh Lord, that as they look on concerning a, their, their sister, O oh Lord, bless them and hear and answer their prayers. It is, Father, that we thank you for the good work that is done in the name of the pregnancy a care sender. And we do pray, O oh Lord, that in the last weeks of this year, uh, that great things would be done, that indeed that babies would be born healthy and strong, and that you might bless uh, all who come uh, into contact with the various folks uh, who are found uh, doing this work in Christ's name and for his uh, glory. Again, it is, O oh Lord, that we pray for Jim. We ask that as he goes to Sudbury, uh, God willing, on Thursday, grant him safety and travel. Bless him as he speaks and gives lectures in various uh, locations. And grant him, O Lord, safety and travel, God willing, a week tomorrow as he returns here to Toronto. We remember Rod and Helen as they would return, God willing, on Thursday. And again, we pray, Father, that you would grant them safety and travel uh, as they come home. So, Lord, we ask now uh, that you would help us to be still, to know that you are God. We pray that you might help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus the apostle and high priest whom it is that we confess. And it is that we ask these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. It is that I do want to extend a, a warm welcome to visitors with us tonight. It is good to have you with us. And we do pray that as you worship God along with ourselves, that you might know of his blessing in your own life. Please know that you're most welcome. Let's again sing to God's praise. This time in Psalm 143 in selection B. 143B. O oh Lord, my spirit fails. That's the wonderful thing about the Psalms. They're just so apropos for a life as, as we experience it. And at times our spirits fail. And we read, uh, the psalmist says, so, so Lord, your answer swiftly send. Hide not your face from me, lest I to depths descend. Because I trust in you, O oh, grant that I might hear your steadfast love again as morning light draws near. You know what it's like through the night when it is that perhaps you can't sleep, it is that the darkness is there, and the night seems to drag, you're weighed down within your own heart and mind, and yet when it is that you see the first glimpses of daylight beginning to break through, just the blessing it is, and knowing that another day is given to you, and perhaps it's that day that God will answer your prayer. So let's then stand to sing 143b to God's praise. Spirit lead. 
distress, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. And then you come to these beautiful words. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. It is that sometimes preachers will say things that not only, not only have their congregations scratching their heads and wondering what it is that they're speaking about, but also it is that when they preach to fellow preachers, it can be the case that fellow preachers will say, well, what exactly were you meaning by this? How is it that you got what you said from the text that you brought before us? Well, there's an instance just recently in which it is that there was a conference for preachers that had been organized by preachers. And it is that it seems that a nationally well-known preacher was one of the main speakers. And when it came to his main talk, his main presentation, it is that he told his hearers, who remember were all preachers themselves, that, and I quote, he'd never been discouraged a day in his life. He'd never been discouraged a day in his life. Well, immediately it seems that he lost all credibility with the preachers who were there. Because it is, as far as they were concerned, a either... A, there was something particularly wrong with him, or it is that he was tell, telling a perhaps lies. Because whether it is that you're a preacher in the pulpit, whether it is that you're a person a, in the pew in God's house, every single one of us has to battle to a certain degree or, or extent with discouragement at various times in our lives. And even if it is that we are God's people. And when it is that I say that everyone has to deal with discouragement, it is that I mean everyone. The Bible tells us that there was no one greater born among men than John the Baptist, but it is that the Scripture also teaches us that John the Baptist got discouraged. Listen to what you read in Luke 7 and from verse 18. The disciples of John reported all of these things to him, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And it's obvious that John was languishing that it is that John was discouraged in terms a, of a lack, perhaps, of assurance uh, that Jesus was indeed who it was that he said he was. And it is that we read, when the men came to John, a, 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 they said, a, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the one who's to come, or shall we look for, for, for another? And Jesus answered and said, go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And so it is that Christ sought to encourage John from his place of discouragement and to build him up in terms of the truths that uh, were being exhibited through the life and ministry and person of Christ. But as I've said, every single one of us has to deal with discouragement in life to some degree at one time or another. Perhaps it is that we're discouraged because we don't know how long our employment is going to last. Perhaps it is that you're discouraged because you're facing difficulties in your marriage, eh, and these difficulties, instead of getting better, are getting worse. Perhaps it is that you're discouraged because the children that God blessed you with, that it is that they're disappointing you, and perhaps there are even cases when it is that they were brought up in the house of God, they're turning, seemingly turning their backs upon the things of God, and then it is that all of us, and particularly, I think, here, it is that we're discouraged when we know that loved ones, that they're dealing with the illness of one sort or another. And so it's a reminder to us that every single one of us has to deal with discouragement, and it is that none of us have the perfect life. Think of a, what it is that history teaches us. We see that people like Martin Luther, the great reformer, people like C.H. Spurgeon in the 19th century, one of the things that characterized their ministry and indeed their whole life experience was that they had to face times of discouragement. As you read through the scriptures from beginning to end, it is that we see some of the great saints of God and also that they had difficult times with discouragement. You get Jeremiah. What was he called? The weeping prophet. If you're discouraged, one of the ways in which that manifests itself is that you weep, that you cry. Think of Jonah. Think of David, whom we're considering tonight. Think of Elijah. Think of Solomon. Think of Abraham. And it is that these great heroes of the faith, as it were, these great men of God that God raised up down through the centuries, it is that part and parcel of their experience of being the servant of God was not only great joy, not only great blessing, but also times of great di di discouragement. And so for a national preacher to say to preachers that he had never been discouraged a day in his life, it seemed to be something that just was absolutely incredulous. Even David, think of what it is that we read through the Psalms. 
Psalm 13, and it is that David says this, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? David's discouraged at this point. And it is that in our text, here, it, here we have this great man of God, and it is that he's discouraged. Naturally, I think, in a sense, it is that the people were crying. He heard them. He saw them. It is that they were distressed. And now it is that they're talking of stoning him. And I think that any one of us in that situation, we wouldn't be saying, oh, well, that's good. Everything's fine, and everything in the garden's rosy. No, like David, you would be discouraged. You would be a tending towards a, a depression. And even... A, when it is that at this point in 1 Samuel 30, David has just returned from, from Gath. And it is that he returns from being in the service of King Achish, one of the lords, the kings of the Philistines. And it is that the Philistines lords, when they, they see the various a, troops heading out a, to, to battle, and they see that Achish has amongst his troops a David a, and David's men, it is that they're saying, no, we're not having this. He may turn against us in the heat of the battle. And we're telling you now, Achish, you have to send him away. And so it is in 1 Samuel 29 and 9 that Achish goes to David and says, I know that you are blameless in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to the battle. And it's with these praises ringing in his ears that David and his men returned to, to Ziklag, and they're anxious naturally to be reunited with their wives, with their friends, with all the ways in which it is that God has blessed them. And what happens when they get to the brow of the hill? It is that they see the smoke. It is that they see that Ziklag's been burned to the ground. It is that they see that the homes that had once been places of laughter and joy and safety, that it is that these homes are now burned. It is that the children whose laughter could be heard in the streets, and indeed the blessing of hearing their wives a voice a, at various points through the day. It is that their wives and their children are gone. The Amalekites had invaded while they were in Afek and had taken captive all that was precious to David and his men. And what a horrendous experience that must have been. And the spirit, as he writes a, a, in Samuel, Look at what he says to us in verse 4. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept. And you, you can understand that. But it's this next phrase, this next descriptor, when it is that we're told, they wept until they had no more strength to weep. Have you ever been there? It's hard enough when you're weeping. But when it is that the weeping has just tired you out so much and you've got no strength even to, 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 to cry. You're so weary and you're so sad. And it is, therefore, that then the people rose up in anger and there was talk of stoning, stoning, stoning David eh, because of their overwhelming grief. And what does David do? Here we read in verse, at the end of verse 6. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Did this calamity fall on David because he was living in sin and he was running from God? Far from it. David, if anything, was running with God, but he's at this point in his life why he's not understanding why the path that he's been led to at this moment is so difficult and so hard. And when I was uh, preparing for tonight, I thought, I want us to feel David's utter despair and gloom. Because when you and I feel down, we all have a tendency to think that no one else has ever been in as bad a situation as we find ourselves in. And if it is that the enemy of our souls can make us think that our situation is uniquely bad, then we begin to start despairing that there is any way back, that it is that things can turn around and that life he can get better. But the wonderful thing that's been taught to us here is this, there's always a way back that it is that there's always hope in the Lord. That the only reason that the Lord allows His children to despair, even of life itself, is so that they learn not to trust in themselves, but to trust in the God who raises the dead. Think of those wonderful words in 2 Corinthians in chapter 1. 
And it is that Paul speaks about the situation that he had been experiencing. He was under great pressure. The words indicate that Paul felt as though he was about to crack mentally and physically in terms of his work for the, for the Lord. And then he says, but this happened. He says, in fact, we felt the sentence of death in our hearts. But then he goes on to say, but this happened that we might not rely upon ourselves, but rely upon God who raises the dead. And that's the encouragement for us tonight, that perhaps you've sinned. Perhaps it is that you feel like God has cast, cast you off. But to you especially, God put David's terrible situation in the Bible to say to you tonight, there is a way back. There is hope for you in the midst of, of your discouragement. And if David is to become the man God uses, he's got to be stripped of everything, including his reputation and his self-will. He's going to cry out of his system, perhaps the last tears of self-pity. He's going to face the full fury of loneliness at this time and overcome it. He's got to put away all memory of applause and praise for what it was he had accomplished and what it is that Achish had said to him and he's not even to look to others for guidance or comfort or strength, family, friends, associates. And it's a case that God fully intended that a crisis be allowed in David's life that would force him to seek an answer within himself. What we forget is that for 16 months, David lived with the Philistines. And it is that David had been leaning too heavily in King Achish. God wanted to give David the kingdom, and it would seem that David was about to settle for, for Ziklag. Could it be that David had grown tired? He'd grown weary of, of so many battles, hardships? Was he at the point where he was tempted to think, really, I need to have an easier lifestyle, and it is that I want to trade the crown for ease and security? Well, it is that God, as he brought about these situations, says to David, and David understood this, David there's a way back. And that's what I want us to consider for a moment this evening, the way back. And especially when it is that we're in situations that literally bring us to our knees and we're weeping and we've been weeping for so long that it is that we can weep no more. First thing is, the way back is an intentional way. Look at verse 6 in the first two words, but David. This is one of the many great uses of the word but in the Scripture. Everything around David is gloom and doom. His property is destroyed or stolen. It is that his wives are, are gone. He doesn't know at this point if he'll ever see them again. And his men were talking of killing him. But David, we're told. And it is that it speaks of intentionality in the part of David. He intentionally, deliberately rejected the faithless gloom and despondency of the men who were saying that they were going to store him. It is that at this point, it's almost as though he intentionally looks beyond the smoldering ruins of Ziklag, and he looks beyond them and considers the greatness of the God who has blessed them in so many, many ways. And David's intention is, is, is presented in such a powerful way. You read, but David strengthened himself. And the Hebrew verb that's used there, it implies a, a, a continuous and persistent effort. It says that there was nothing of passivity in David's part at this point about coming back to the Lord in a time of despair, that it was something that didn't happen accidentally, but it is that David literally took himself by his lapels and said, it is that I'm going to strengthen myself in the Lord my God. That's why it was that we sang in Psalm 42, and elsewhere in, in, in the psalm you read this, why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him, the help of my countenance. What is it that He's doing? He's talking to Himself. Now, normally if you talk to yourselves, people say, well, you better go and see the doctor. But when it is that you come to the Scripture, one of the things that the Scripture teaches should characterize the child of God is that often that there might be this internal dialogue with themselves so that they eventually might have that external dialogue and prayer with their heaven, heavenly father. It's like the prodigal son. The prodigal son comes to the point where he says, I'm going to get up out of this pigsty and I'm going to go back to my father. 
Unless it was that there was this intentionality in his part, he would have remained where he was. And so the challenge for us tonight, when it is that we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, will we keep that intentionality of spirit before us, that it is that we might seek with God's help eh, to strengthen ourselves in the God who has promised us that he'll not leave us nor forsake us? So there's intentionality here in terms of the way back. Second thing is, it's a personal way. Look at what you read. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. In other words, David knew God in a personal way. God was not just the God of David's country, even though it is that he lived in the covenant nation of Israel. God wasn't just the God of David's father. God wasn't just the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and who was not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And even though it had been the case that David had been raised up in a God-fearing home, David is saying to us here that God was David's personal God. That it is, we could put it in Christian terms, David had a saving interest in the Lord Jesus Christ. That it is, that as he considered time and his, the reality in which it is that God had placed him, he didn't just see, as it were, the amassing of, of atoms or whatever else it may be coming together in some amorphous mass and then producing the creation. But whatever it was that he looked, whatever it was that he experienced, it is that he saw God. He experienced the hand of God, and it is that he was able to say that this God is my God. He'd enjoyed personal fellowship with God as he watched his father's sheep when he was out in the fields with the sheep as a young man. It's there that he composed many a psalm. It's there that he composed Psalm 23. And he shows that he knows the shepherd of the sheep, that it is that this Lord is his shepherd. And even as he as a shepherd cared for his father's sheep, likewise it is that this great eternal shepherd cares for the sheep of his father's flock. And you see, you don't know God if you don't know him personally. And that's what the Scripture teaches, that there has to be, and sometimes we get upset when we speak about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But Christ is a person. And Christ, by His Spirit, reveals Himself to us in the way that it is that we are united to Him in this relationship, whereby it is that He speaks to us from His Word. He speaks to us by the moving of the Spirit whereby it is that we speak to Him and bring before Him the things that concern us and the needs and the desires that are ours as we come to the throne in prayer. And it is that you come to know God in a personal way through a personal faith in His Son and recognizing who He is and what He has done. Listen to what Jesus said, John 17 and 3. For this is eternal life. And how is it that he describes eternal life? Is it in terms of duration of time? No. He says that they may know you, the only true God and Christ Jesus whom you have sent. He's saying eternal life is experienced in terms of a relationship and an ongoing relationship. So it is that the way back is personal. The way back is intentional. Third thing is, the way back is a repentant way. Now, repentance, we know, means to a turn around or to change direction. You're going that way, and now it is that you're going that way. You're turning from sin and from self, and you're turning to God and being helped by God. And the, the thing is that the reason that David ends up in this situation from a human perspective is that earlier he hadn't sought God's direction in his decision to go over to Achish, the king of Gath. In fact, what it was that David had decided he would do violated God's explicit prohibitions for his people in terms of forming alliances with the pagans of the land. But notice how David now is very careful to seek God's direction and to obey it. In David's day, a person could seek God's will through the Urim and the Thummim, which were contained in the, in the ephod the vest like a, a garment that the high priest wore. And it is that the scholars and commentators differ in their understanding of how it is a, that this operated, but it seems to have been some sort of God-ordained system of drawing a, a lots. And that's what David does. It is that he seeks God now a, in this manner 
and in this way. And that's what it is that we read from verse 7. Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? And God re re replies positively. And it is that the way back to God then always involves acknowledging that you were wrong. You thought you were right. And yet it is you were wrong. And because of that wrong heart, wrong decision, wrong attitude that you thought would bring you closer to God, often it is that you end up further away from God than you first began with. And you need to turn from that wrong. That's what it is that God wants and desires. And just as David now calls for the ephod in front of all his men, so that they could see that David is not presenting himself as the one who's calling the shots. David is seeking and submitting to the Lord and it is that his repentance at this point he is a public repentance in front of others so that those who see what it is that David is doing are able to rationalize and say, well, he was going that way. Now it is that he's going this way. And so there's this aspect of repentance to, to going back. You see, the devil, he doesn't want us to go back. The devil doesn't want us to, to repent. We have an enemy of our souls, and too readily we, we forget this. We have forces that are arrayed against the body of Christ that seek constantly to pull us down and to bring us to our knees physically and spiritually. And how often is it perhaps you've wanted to go to the place of repentance, the posture of repentance, if we could put it like that, and it is that the voice has come into your head, you again? How can you do it? How can you go back? You've been before in that posture of repentance. And it is that you said that you wouldn't do this and you were sorry for doing that. But now it is that you're coming back again. He's going to cast you aside. And that's what the devil wants us to believe. And we need to remember that upon the cross, our sins, past, present, and future, have all been forgiven. All of them. And there's an intentionality in terms of our thought processes as we consider this. The example comes to mind, I think I've maybe used it before, but a pastor friend that, that I used to have in Scotland, and he told me about this individual in his congregation who was an alcoholic. And it is that at times he would sober up, and he would sober up for, for so many weeks, months, even, even, even a year, and then it is, as they say, he, he fell off the, the wagon. And it is that he ended up back a, 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 a living out a, as an alcoholic and so on. And it is that he would phone this pastor friend of mine and he would say, you know, I, I, I don't know if the Lord will accept me. And he said to him, look, he says, you repent and you ask God for his mercy and his grace. And it is that you will be saved. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And it is that this individual, very often he would say to him, but I don't feel it. I don't feel forgiven. I don't feel saved. And that's where it is that the intentionality in terms of our thinking comes to, 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 to the forefront, as it were. At times, I don't feel a Christian. Do you? Let's be honest. At times I begin to doubt, have I even been converted? Let's be honest, that's the way it is at times. We don't feel, but I'm thankful for the Word, of what it is that the Word tells me, and what it is that the Word tells me to interact with in terms of my thought processes. And when it is that that happens, then it is that the truth goes into my heart, and my heart is uplifted. And I thank God for what, what He's done. And so, the, the way back, there's an intentionality, it's personal, it's repent. The way back is submissive. Look at what he says in verse 8. David inquires, shall I pursue after this band? And I think there are many in this situation who wouldn't have bothered to ask the question. They would say, look, these bad guys have stolen our possessions and our families. Let's go and get them. Let's go and sort them out for what it is that they've done. But look at what David does, and again, the intentionality. It is that he deliberately stops to ask the Lord, should I pursue this group 
and try and recover what it is that they've taken? What if God had said to David, no, David, your wife and your possessions are gone? How would he have responded then? It would have been hard for him. It would have been hard for you. It would have been hard for me. And yet it is, I think, on the basis of what we're seeing here, and as David strengthens himself and the Lord is God, he would have submitted. And it's saying to us that you can't write down your own terms when you come to the Lord. You can't come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'll come back if it is that you will do what I want. That's not the way it operates. That's not the way it works. He's the Lord. He is God. And it is that he does as he wants, and it is that as he does as he wants, it's always for his glory and for your good. And whether it is that God says to us, it's all gone, or whether it is that he graciously gives all back to us, it is that we are called to submit. That's what we're called to do. And then the way back is trusting. God told David, David, you'll recover everything. And David took God at his word. Now, those of you who have had, know of me from the 26 years I've been here, I think even in the early years, this was one thing that I would say until my wife said to me, stop saying it. <laughs> you repeat it too often, and it was, this, it was this. Do you take God at his word? Do you die? Do you believe what it is that God has said he will, will do? You see, true saving faith is taking God at his word. And often in the face of overwhelming circumstances to the contrary, and then obediently acting upon the word until what is promised is a reality in our lives. That's the way it is. And then the way back is generous. And the way to pursue a, what's been taken 200 of David's men out of the 600 are too exhausted to go on. So they stay behind with, with the baggage. And you read of that in verses 9 eight, and, and, and 10. And after they had defeated the enemy and recovered more than they had lost, when it is that the 400 men who were with David came back, we read in verse 22 that they didn't want to share the spoils. Look at what you read in verse 22. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, because they didn't go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children a, and a depart. But notice David. He doesn't let them act in this greedy way. And he gives to the men who stayed behind an equal share, and he sent generous gifts to his fellow countrymen in the surrounding towns. And the point is, I think, that the Lord doesn't restore you to himself so that you can live in comfort and ease, so that you can be happy and live a self-centered life, that it is that you hoard to yourself all the blessings that he's graciously given, but it is that the Lord never gives his blessings to us just to make us happy, but he gives blessings to us <coughs> so that we can share them with others. And so that he is glorified. And so, as a believer tonight, you can go pretty low when you take the path away from the Lord. But there's always a way back. And that's what we've been seeing. Second thing, and we'll go through this a lot quicker. We've got a way back, and there's a God to whom it is we come back. What can we say about the God we come back to? He's sovereign. The Amalekite raid in Ziklag, while David and his men were gone, was not an accident. God wasn't in heaven sort of shaking his fists and saying, well, I was worried about Saul and the armies of Israel. Those dirty Amalekites sneaked out in there and got one over on me. That's not what God was saying. But the God who works all things after the counsel of his own will used this seeming tragedy in the life of David and his men to teach them to seek him and his face to trust him when it is that everything seems absolutely hopeless. That's the simple teaching of a, what it means to go back to God and this sovereign Lord. 
as David strengthens himself in the Lord his God, he sees this great disaster as a great opportunity for God to show himself as the covenant-keeping God. David didn't express his rage toward God and say, if you really loved me, you wouldn't have allowed this to happen. And that's so often what we're tempted to do. He didn't blame God. But he submitted to the sovereign God, and he obeyed God in what it was that God told him to do. Look at how God's sovereignty is even seen in this little incident in, in, in verse 11. And it is concerning the Egyptian that, that they found. They just seem to happen eh, upon him. The Egyptian has got sick. He couldn't keep up with his eh, raiding party. And it is that his Amalekite master thought, I've just got a, a rotten bunch of new slaves. Who needs this kid? And it is that he tosses them aside like an empty can of Coca-Cola. But as so often as true, God uses the world's discards in a sovereign plan. And that's what's happening here. Even this individual. And here you have this individual, this slave, who's proving to be the key, humanly speaking, in recovering what the Amalekites had taken. God was in control of everything. He was orchestrating it all and piecing it all together. And if it was the case that David had not been kind and generous to this hurting man who had had food or water for three days, he would have missed God's provision. So what's the application? And for those of us who are finding it difficult to strengthen ourselves in the Lord our God, well, it's this. There is great comfort for the believer to know that however bleak your situation is, that your sovereign God is still on the throne and that He has ordained all things that come to pass, even the tiniest of details, to display His might on behalf of those who trust Him. That's what it's saying to us in terms of His sovereignty. Nothing happens by chance. Now again, do we believe that? Is that how we consider our lives? That God is orchestrating everything? Not just the good things, but even the seemingly not so good things. And yet He still promised us, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And not only is God sovereign, but He's sufficient. The Amalekites had stolen David's goods, but they couldn't steal David's God. One commentator put it like this, whatever else we lose, as long as we have him, we are rich. And whatever else we possess, we are poor as long as we have not him. God is enough, whatever else may go. God is enough, whatever else may go. Now, I'm not saying that's easy to put into practice. I'm not saying that that's something that will immediately, as it were, scare off discouragement of one sort or another. But it's something, again, with intentionality that we need to keep bringing before our minds that God is enough for me, whatever else may go in my life. He is enough for me. It seems, as we know, Charles Spurgeon, that he was prone to terrible depression. It's amazing to think that the man who was used so mightily by God and is still used by God, he was prone to great depression. And one day he's riding home and it seems he was feeling very weary. He was discouraged and he was down. And then suddenly he says, God burst through with this verse, my grace is sufficient for you. And Spurgeon says he replied, and only Spurgeon I think could say this, I should think it is, Lord. And he burst out laughing, he said, as he thought in this. And he began to say, he says, my unbelief then seems so absurd. And then he said this, it was as if a little fish, being very thirsty, was troubled about drinking the river dry, and the river said to the little fish, my stream is sufficient for you, little fish. And Spurgeon said, that's what God was, was saying to me. And then he said, I was thinking about Joseph in Egypt. And he said, I thought of a little mouse in the granaries of Egypt after seven years of plenty. And the little mouse feared that it might die during the famine. And it is that Joseph, seeing the little mouse, said to the little mouse, 
Cheer up, little mouse. My granaries are sufficient for you. Aren't those beautiful pictures that Spurgeon painted? And the way in which he sought to encourage him himself. What need do we have, no matter how desperate our situation is, that the God who spoke the universe into existence, who said, let there be light, and there was light, that it is that he's not able to meet your need and my need, whether it be large, whether it be small. He's sovereign, the God you go back to, he's sufficient, and then thirdly and finally, he's He's gracious. God's grace, as we know, means He doesn't deal with us according to our sins, but according to His great mercy and the mercy that He's showing us in, in Jesus. And His grace is inexhaustible toward his, his people in every age. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Paul tells us that in Romans a chapter 2. Do you suppose that when David and his men saw Ziklag burnt to the ground, and their families gone, their possessions gone, their homes destroyed? Do you think they perhaps asked that familiar question that at times we ask, where is God in all this? How can God possibly be in this situation? Had he abandoned David because David had gotten snagged by sin and depending upon Achish, king of Gath? Don't miss this because it's a beautiful picture in terms of what this account in chapter 30 is telling us. It's telling us that while David was reaping the consequences of his sin, and he, he's at one of the lowest points in his entire life, that God is graciously working on David's behalf to give David the throne of Israel. That God had graciously used the Philistine commanders to get David out of a compromising situation that he was in, and at that very moment, as David and his men were lamenting the destruction of Ziklag, God was using the Philistines to remove Saul so that David could become king. So even the loss of Ziklag was God's gracious provision because it destroyed David's roots in Philistia and it opened the way for David to move to Hebron when he began his rule over Israel. And you see, often God must destroy our links with the world so that we can see that God only wants the best for us and gives us the best. And sometimes it may be what one is called a severe mercy that God gives to us. But even the severest of mercies that we experience from God, God always acts in grace toward His children even as he does here. I close with this account of Martin Luther. Luther, as you know, was prone to depression as well. And often Martin Luther was overwhelmed with, with depression. And it didn't seem to lift this time he had it in spite of the appeals of his family and his friends. Finally, his wife, Katie, she walked into the room where he was in and she'd put on black a garments of, of a widow in mourning. And Luther noticed, and he said to Katie, Katie, who's died? And she replied, well, Martin, God in heaven must have died, judging from the way you are at the moment. And it seems that instantly Luther's depression lifted, and he laughed, and he kissed his wise wife. My friends, here online, you may be low tonight. You may be discouraged. You may be lower discouraged before the year is over or throughout even the year to come. But just remember this, that no matter how you, low you go, there is that way back. And that way back is to a sovereign, sufficient, and gracious Lord. And that way is always open. And it is in Christ every day, but particularly in the Lord's day as the gospel is proclaimed. It is that God, through the outstretched arms of a crucified and risen Savior, says, Come to me. 
come to me. Come to me. And so, I hope and pray that all of us, that in the coming days, and when it needs to be done, that like David, we might strengthen ourselves in the Lord our God. Amen. Let's stand to pray. Father, it is that we thank you for your word. We thank you for these accounts of the saints of old. It is, O Lord, that when we read of them, and we think particularly in David's experience, just how it is that they're presented to his warts and all. And we can but scarce imagine what it must have been like for David at this point. From the men who had seemed so for him, it is that they're at the point that he want to stone him and take his life from him. And yet, again, we see how David, even through his failings, and they were many, yet it is that he was the man after God's own heart because he always recognized that God was there for him and able to bless him. And we pray that all of us tonight, without exception, here and online, that in the days to come, if there should be a circumstances in our life that are because of our own folly, that lead to discouragement, if it is that your providence should seem a severe and difficult providence for us and a severe mercy, help us to remember, Lord, how David was. And help us with your word and with the Spirit applying a, the word to our hearts and minds to strengthen ourselves in you. Go with us, Lord, through the remainder of this your day. Be with us in the week that lies ahead. And accept us in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let's conclude by singing to God's praise in Psalm 77 and the A selection. 77A. My voice to God aloud I plead. My voice to God, he will me heed. I sought the Lord, I was distressed. I gave my outstretched arms no rest. He's going back to his sovereign God. And it is that the psalmist is saying to us, you do that as well. Let's stand to sing 77a to God's praise. My voice to God alone I plead, my voice to God, He will be heed. I sought the Lord, I was distressed, I gave my outstretched hands no rest, my restless
Now may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, rest and remain in each one of you this day and forevermore. Amen. We conclude with the doxology 41c. Thank you.